Thank you very much, Dr. Panhan. <laughs> Let's welcome the first speaker, Dr. Alfredo Calharius from uh, Central Hospitalar Universitario de Porto, Portugal. Dr. Alfredo Calharius is the director of the neurosurgery department at Central Hospitalar Universitario de Porto and member of Portuguese uh, Society of Spinal Pathology. His topic is Basic Principles in UBE. Yes, Dr. Alfredo. Hello. I will share my... Just a moment, please. Afternoon. Thank you very much for your invitation and for being here today. My name is Alfredo Calheiros. I'm a neurosurgeon in uh, Oporto, in the beautiful city of Oporto. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today with you. Uh, I'm going to talk about my experience with uh, UBI techniques and uh, the difficulties that uh, a neurosurgeon, a neurosurgeon who has always done microsurgery can uh, have when starting the, these uh, techniques. Uh, I want to share with you some difficulties that I had during the, the surgery when I started, because it can help those who are starting now. Uh, which... Uh, which patient to choose for the first uh, uh, surgery? To begin with, I think that the patient with a uh, lumbar stenosis canal is the best. In the first surgery, to gain experience, we start by drilling the lamina, removing the ligament flavin, and after when we feel comfortable with, uh, with these steps, we begin to approach lumbar disc herniation, moving with the retarder the, the nerve away, exposing the disc, and finally uh, to do the dissectomy. I think for the right-handed surgeon, is, uh, it is best to start with the left hernias because it's, it, it's uh, easier to work with the endoscope in the left hand and uh, the working channel in the right hand. For the, the left surgeon, it is the opposite. Second step, identify the level to approach and mark the skin incision. Um, at the beginning of surgery, you have to mark the level uh, of this and where to make the incision in the skin. We do it, uh, we do it with the arm, as you can see in this image, and you have to draw two lines, two important lines. The red line is marking the junction between the lamina and the spinous process. The vertical line, the black line, it's drawn medial to the medial edge of the pedicle. The localization of these points are very important for the surgeon. The red line shows us where to start the, the drilling the lamina, and it also defines where to make the skin incision for the endoscope entry, and work at uh, working channel. It is one incision, one and a half centimeter above the, the line, and then other one and a half centimeter below of this red line, and always medial to the vertical black line. One more important, uh, I think it's uh, an important detail, is to check with the X-ray that the direction to the, the endoscope is parallel to the disc to be approached, and as shown uh, by the head arrow in this image. It's very, very important to pay attention to this for uh, the surgery go well. Uh, what kind of lens to use? Zero degrees, 30 degrees? Okay, for those who are using to doing microsurgery, my opinion is the zero degrees lens would probably be the most comfortable. For me, in the first surgery, I used the zero degree endoscope, but if in the meantime, I tried the 30 degrees lens and I like it 
better. Currently, uh, I use uh, uh, only the 30 uh, degrees lens because I think that the endoscope gives me uh, a broader a broader view. And for example, to approach the disc and and the, the foramen uh, and to make the dissect me, I feel safe and more comfortable with this lens. Uh, Another important detail is the, uh, the incision in the lumbar fascia. It is a small detail, but it's very important for the surgery to go well. When making the skin incision, you have to make sure that lumbar fascia has opened well. If you need, you can feel it with your finger. You, you, you feel it with your finger, it's, uh, the fascia is open. And why is it is so important? It is important for two reasons. First, first the incision must, uh, must be large enough to allow a large amount of saline solution to flow in and out and out. When we when uh, we introduce the endoscope into the open incision and open saline solution, it's very very important to see the solution coming out of the lower low like you, you can see in, in, in this video. It is the, also necessary to be careful that the endoscope, endoscope working channel is not narrow and that it allows a good exit of liquid, like, like I said before. In my first surgery, I had this problem and the, the endoscope channel did not have a good flow of saline solution and I I couldn't see uh, very well. The second reason is the fascia also has to be wide open so that when the carriage or another instruments are inserted through the lower incision, they, they need to slide mostly to the dips over the retractor and there is no need to apply pressure for the instrument to enter. This is very important too. Another, an, uh, another point is the irrigation system. Uh, in my first surgery, I used saline solution bags controlling the pressure through, uh, through the, the gravity. However, I started using now the infusion pump. Uh, why? These pumps uh, uh, allow us to increase or decrease the flow of liquid during the surgery. And what is the advantage? For me, for example, sometimes in the first surgery, I had a problem. Um, in my operative fields, appears uh, some air bubbles, and uh, it's hard to, for me to, to see clear the, the, the operative field. So with the pump flow, I increase the flow of solution and the, the bubble disappear. Another situation is when we have a small bleeding. If you increase the pressure, you are able to control the bleeding and you don't need to uh, use the, the coagulation. Another advantage is when we do a type... Yes. Sorry? Sorry? Another Uh, another advantage is when we do a, a dissectomy, we don't need to always take the faucet out to clean it because if we increase the flow of the liquid, the fragments are removed by the flow, by the solution, without uh, to need to remove the, always the, the faucets. Uh, another important point for me is uh, when uh, is, uh, when is starting this technique is to um, it's the placement of the endoscope and the in, in instrument to meet each other. This is the theory of the triangulation for the endoscope. The point where they meet each other is the multifield uh, field of triangular area. This is area is uh, fat tissue, and is uh, connective tissue, and the floor is the lamina. This is the area. This uh, area is the most important uh, important space to do the, this uh, surgery. For me, in the first surgery, it was to, it's very difficult to to see the ablation device and the endoscope. Uh, a lot of time, uh, a lot of time is wasted in in, the, in this this step. 
either because we cross the endoscope with the instruments or because you are too far away and we cannot see the relation tip and you should only start the relation with direct division. Uh, this is a matter of training, but a little trick for this. When we introduce the relation in, in the work portal, we must orientate the face that do the ablation towards the endoscope because it's too easier, it's easier to identify than the, the, the tip of the device. Finally, you can start the channel decoupation. As I mentioned, the main point is the, uh, the junction of the lamina and the spinal process. With the radio frequency device, at this point, we clean the fat, like we see, and connective uh, tissue middle to the multifidous muscle, expo exposing the lamina. This is done with radio frequency ablation, and as you see in the, the movie, and after, with the carison, we will take part of the lamina. But before this, when do you have a good, like you, you see, when you have a, we have a good view of the lamina and spinal process, we will start to drill the lamina with a drill, a shaver, I use a shaver, with a four or five millimeters. We are drilling and with the carison, you will see this, we will take the, the medial part of the lamina and also uh, a little part uh, of the superior articula uh, articular process. Then, with a uh, 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 hook, we open the ligament, and with, and with the carcin, we remove until the canal is decompressed. Here, you can see in the lateral part, the, the, the nerve is decompressed, and this technique allows us to decompress the other side over the top. You can see here the, the canal decompressed and the other side, the right, the right side, because we begin in the left side, completely decompress. You will see the fat tissue of the right side and the... Now, now, you can see the right side um, already decompressed. In conclusion, uh, most of us neurosurgeons do not have training in the endoscopy. For those who have microsurgery uh, micro training, it can help. Uh, the uh, image is similar, but the focal length is completely different. In endoscopy, you have an in a image that is on top of target, giving the feeling, for example, that we drilling a little, but when we confirm with the X-ray, we come to the conclusion that we have done much, much more. For me, another difference for, for microsurgery is, for example, when we want to decompress from the opposite side, like we saw before, uh, we have much better Im image than in microsurgery. We, uh, it allows us to perform a good decompression with more safety. We, uh, we, we did not to push the sac dural to see the, the, the other side. So I think that UV techniques is an excellent technique for spine surgery. It is a minimal invasive surgery and uh, that in the future with the experience of the surgeon, there will be more indication in the spine surgery, like we saw uh, today in the uh, colleagues are told. Like any tech, it has a learning curve, but I think, as I said, that the surgeon who has experience in spine microsurgery will uh, quickly get used to this new technique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Alfredo, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Dear audience, if you have any question, please record it and then we will discuss it later. Uh, let's welcome the next speaker, Dr. Khalid Abdul Shafi from Dola Hospital Namar, Riyadh uh, KS Saudi. Dr. Khalid Abdul Shafi is the consultant neurosurgeon 
at the Dalla Hospital, Neymar Hospital, Riyadh, KS. His topic is UB advantages over the tubular system in management of lumbar canal stenosis. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Could you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. It's okay. Uh, so I know it's the end of the day, and I think in China it's like yeah. after 10 o'clock at night. So I would like to go discussing some. Uh, we will discuss uh, a few points about uh, the advantages of UBE surgery uh, in comparison to tubular uh, system or matrix. So usually the surgery is the studies is not sufficient uh, in uh, and no enough number of studies comparing those two techniques so uh, declaration i have uh, no conflict of interest let's take this part out okay uh, before the era of ube uh, for lumbar canal stenosis, uh, approaches you, uh, included two uh, systems. The, the, the main system uh, was the tubular microendoscopic, the matrix, and the other system was the percutaneous lumbar endoscopic uh, discectomy. So the tubular microendoscopic approach considered to be the most popular minimal invasive approach that can be performed with minimal muscle dissection and carry comparable outcome to standard microdiscectomy. So we, when we are talking with the people regarding for, to convince them about the surgery, minimal invasive surgery, some people was convinced about the percutaneous lumbar endoscopic by itself, and other was convinced about the tubular. So we would like, if we would like to bring those two techniques together, like blending, so, we're bringing the tubular microendoscopic with disadvantages and uh, minimal uh, dissection and uh, fast recovery to the blood surgery with uh, its advantages. So as a conclusion, we can reach mixture of, uh, uh, of uh, surgical um, benefit for the patient so we can get the UBE. When we want to talk about the minimal invasive spine surgery, MIS surgery considered to be alternative for open lumbar surgery. So there is variant uh, approaches. Each of them has its unique indications, advantages, and limitations for sure. Many surgeons used to implement some modifications. Since early morning, we can see different surgeons uh, implementing their own uh, preference uh, in their approach. Uh, in 1986, uh, Ho Jin wrote uh, about his concept of minimal invasive surgery and he wrote microlumbar discectomy. Is that consist, uh, is, is that uh, it consists of the ability to do the surgical maneuver of a standard partial hemilaminectomy that have stood the test of time, but though a much smaller incision. And they can raise the question today, what if we are able to do bilateral complete lumbar spine decompression, including laminectomy, discectomy, and bilateral foraminotomy? I'm gonna name it as 180 degrees decompression bilateral. So what is the valuable minimal invasive surgical approach? When we can say this is the minimal invasive approach. So usually the approach with broad indication, small wound incision, less muscle dissection, less bone drilling, complete decompression, short operative time, less blood loss, short length of hospitalization, and for sure the clinical parameters, fast recovery period. We're gonna discuss it later in our presentation. 
So tubular microendoscopic surgery versus unilateral bilateral endoscopic surgery. So are we able to perform bilateral decom decompression using those two techniques? Is it easy to access the contralateral side with the tubular system itself? And how efficient it is? The tubular system, bilateral lumbar spinal decompression. We can see in the literature, Balmer et al. in uh, his paper in, that published in 2002, he just described using the tubular system for bilateral decompression. And this is how he illustrate using the tubular system going from ipsilateral to contralateral side. And there was 17 patient was uh, operated with the 22 levels total number. And the mean operative time was 90 minutes, one and a half hour. And uh, in his study, the mean blood loss was 28 ml. And he achieved good decompression with absence of post-operative stenosis in 13 level, about 60%. And even eight patients in his uh, study were having a grade one spondylolisthesis, and they were, they were stable for three months post-operatively. So no issues with the stability. So the number of comparative, comparative studies between UBE and the tubular system we can see still no enough studies. Uh, from Taiwan, a paper uh, recently published as a review of unilateral bilateral endoscopic uh, decompression for degenerative lumbar canal stenosis. I'm uh, going to cut it short with this paper. So, only I can find there is uh, one study uh, published by Dr. Hugh et al. Prospective, it was for a total uh, uh, 31 uh, month for minimal invasive and UBE surgery 14 month with the complications of the dural tear and hematoma as the vast majority. So when we are looking to the other uh, published paper, that comparing the UBE with minimal invasive surgery, I'm not talking about tubular here, minimal invasive or microdiscectomy, we can see it all as retrospective and it's raised after the uh, era of UBE, all of them like 20, 20, 20, uh, 22, uh, 2020, 2021. So Dr. Song et al conducted the multi-center a retrospective study to compare the clinical result of UBE with open microdiscectomy. In his study, that retrospectively looking for one year back about patient operated micro uh, micro uh, discectomy using a tubular system or Caspar retractor in comparison to UBE. And he concluded that UBE have similar case spectrum with open microdiscectomy. And the still till that time, we don't have a prospective study comparing, comparing the UBE with tubular system. Because if we speaking with some uh, physicians from North America mainly, where I published the next uh, study, they will ask us, what's the UBE? When we send this paper to be published in a clinical spine journal in the United States, we submit to them a lot of uh, papers illustrating the UBE technique because all people doing uh, the tubular system as a minimal invasive procedure. So when I met Dr. Hayati, this is our paper that published uh, uh, in 2021. So uh, when we are talking about this paper to, to, to introduce the UBE surgery as a minimal invasive procedure. We uh, selected total number of patients, uh, 154, and we elect to uh, 
do it as a random uh, control study. Uh, we divided those uh, gr to two groups, UBE surgery and the tubular microendoscopic surgery. And uh, the selection was randomly. The first, the, the, the case gonna come, uh, first visit will be choose as a UBE for UBE and the, the case after gonna be the tubular microendoscopic and like this. Um, in uh, biography, you can see the age ranging uh, in uh, 65, the mean, and the, the sex between male and female, uh, male patient is 57 and female 43. The uh, body, uh, the uh, body mass index uh, was uh, in uh, both groups around the 27. And for uh, other comorbidities like uh, DM hypertension, uh, smoker peoples uh, was uh, nearly the same or to, yeah, ne nearly to the same number. So the surgical indications to go for bilateral de decompression using the tubular system or the UBE was significant single level stenosis that requiring bilateral decompression as the case illustrated here. Uh, when we uh, talking about the tubular system, uh, usually we describing the localization, the landmark for procedure, identification, the lamina, and ducking the tube in the uh, parallel to the disc space. So usually the surgeon in uh, using the matrix system, standing, looking in, the, uh, looking through the microscope, and uh, his instrument gonna be uh, in a small uh, trajectory, uh, and his hand uh, need to be near to each other, and to give a space even for, to visualize the uh, surgical field, and uh, here I can just show you the area, the working area near uh, the junction between the spinous process and the lamina and how the visual field is look, looked like uh, during the procedure. A new BE procedure, the localization, two ports, and just AB and lateral view to confirm that you are parallel to the level. The surgeon is facing the monitor, looking forward, having free hands, one port for the instruments and one port for the scope. He can control the uh, visualization through uh, either to keep it near to the field or out of the uh, uh, working area. A new BE operative uh, view, you can see in epsilateral, we can achieve the uh, epsilateral foraminotomy and we can view it uh, here. The epsilateral uh, transfer, traversing uh, nerve root. And you can, with the same instrument you are using for microdiscectomy, you can approach the contralateral area and even you can uh, do a full decompression of the contralateral nerve root. What we use in our uh, study, um, the clinical parameter, the Oswest Street Stability Index, to look after the improvement after two years follow up, we are doing immediate post op monitoring, and then after one month, then at the third month, then after uh, each six months till total to two years, 24 months. We can see with Auschwitz Disability Index, it was severe form preoperatively to decrease immediately, was operatively to moderate till the reach, till reaching to the six months post operatively while we can consider this as uh, um, the point where we can see the maximum 
uh, result within one year. So if you are following the result till two uh, till 24 months at the end, so it's nearly to the result of uh, six months while it's like uh, a great improvement from severe to moderate to uh, uh, very mild form. If you are using the Zurich uh, questionnaire, it's the same. You can see the comparison between the UBE and the microdiscectomy. The UBE has a superiority in clinical uh, improvement. While both techniques having uh, the same uh, improvement with the severity clinical uh, statistics uh, documenting the superiority of UBE and improvement again at the same uh, same as before at the six months we can see the uh, amount of improvement in clinical findings it's gonna be continue till the tw two, two years from this we can conclude that uh, follow-up for six months was operatively gonna give us the hint whether the patient gonna progress to uh, through the improvement or will have any issues. So this is critical period for follow-up. Uh, the success rate, uh, we calculated that uh, UBE has uh, 84% uh, success rate in OST uh, with uh, disability index. And uh, in Zurich Cloud uh, Questionnaire, we have uh, 79 uh, percentage uh, success rate in comparison to the tubular system, 73%. For the admission period, the UBE has shorter admission period. Operative time, the UBE has a shorter operative time. It's a minutes actually, and it's like seven minutes between both groups, but it's shorter over the, uh, when we're talking about 154 case, uh, so that the, the operative time is a matter here. Estimated blood loss, we can see the UBE uh, has a less blood loss. And uh, in modified McNabb criteria, uh, I love this uh, result here. While the excellent result in UBE procedure is uh, 63%, while in tubular microendoscopic procedure is 29. When we are telling excellent result, it means no pain, no restriction of mobility, and return to normal work and uh, level of activity. So when we're comparing both, it's like a double in UBE. And in good occasion, occasional radiculopathy, uh, relief of uh, presenting symptoms, able to return to uh, modified uh, work, the UBE has 29% for sure in comparison to tubular microendoscopy because the ex it was uh, deviated toward the excellent result here. And for fair, uh, five uh, new BE and 13 in tubular microendoscopy. And the uh, poor result uh, is less in new BE procedure in comparison the tubular, to the tubular system. So UBE surgery uh, provides a clear visualization of neural elements, degenerative surrounding structures, and congested epidural veins which are crucial to achieve the best uh, operative decompression. In uh, tubular microendoscopy, it's, uh, it has a limitation and the, the, that limitation attributable to changing uh, of the working cannula di uh, direction, while you, are, you need to go to the contralateral and you need to modify your direction again. Narrow visualization of uh, the surgical field with difficulty in bleeding control and uh, inadequate achievement of uh, contralateral neural decompression uh, as documented in the literature. Furthermore, in our study, uh, four cases uh, using a tubular system required uh, reoperation due to poor operative uh, visualization and resistant compression. And uh, this is my conclusion here. 
between the UBE and the tubular system, given its uh, demanding learning curve, the UBE is considered as alternative to tubular microendoscopic procedure with the higher clinical success rate. This is a study published, uh, and now we are talking about uh, evidence-based. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Khaled Abul Shafi. Now, uh, we, if you have uh, any question, we will discuss on it in later. Please record it. Let's welcome the next speaker, Dr. Javier Julio Oliveira from Hospital Star Medica and Age Cuaretaro, Mexico. He is the AOSPAM member and faculty. His topic is the broad spectrum of spinal pathologies reached with the biportal endoscopy surgery. Thank you, Professor. Can you see my screen good? Yes, very nice. Perfect. Very good. No hey, so, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. Again, it's a pleasure to stay with you and share my my experience regarding biportal endoscopic surgery. Uh, today, I only want to share uh, my review about the spectrum that biportal endoscopy can reach for different pathologies, especially the generative pathologies of lumbar spine. So the advantages that I can perceive regarding biportal endoscopy are the clear visibility of the surgical field to do continuous alien irrigation because biportal endoscopy is a complete endoscopic technique, a water-based endoscopic technique. Also the high accuracy uh, unilateral biportal endoscopy can reach or being addressed uh, toward a specific target when the pathology requires that. The also, also the surgical tools are familiar to the surgeon. We can work with uh, different surgical tools that we use as, as spine surgeons. So it's very familiar. And the minimal motion restriction in the surgical field for the surgeons, it's very good. It, it's, it's, uh, it's very important to feel comfortable during the surgery. Um, so we can obtain sufficient decompression through biportal endoscopy in lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, we have a lot of uh, evidence in, uh, in the literature. So we published before uh, uh, an article regarding that topic, and we found that uh, we can reach uh, an expansion of the dural sac after surgery, after biportal surgery, similar to microscopic surgery. Uh, the surgeon can observe directly the neural elements and can uh, decompress the central part of the spinal canal and also can address uh, his, his, his approach to the lateral aspects of the uh, spine. So we can decompress also the subarticular area or if the case require the foraminal area with different approaches. In this video, I show how we can reach the both the both traversing nerves if the case required in a patient with uh, multi-level spinal stenosis, and the radiological and clinical outcomes also correlate with our surgery and with our results during the surgery regarding decompression of the neural elements. Also, uh, with this approach that is called unilateral laminotomy for bilateral decompression or ULBD, UBD, UBE, the indications are lumbar spinal central stenosis especially, but we can also treat other pathologies like mono or multi-level central stenosis, uh, broad-based lumbar disherniations, low-grade fixed spondylolisthesis, uh, mild to severe degenerative stenosis and degenerative scoliosis in some cases, if the case requires that neural elements should be decompressed. Also, patients with neurogenic claudication, unilateral or bilateral radicular symptoms can be suitable for this approach. Uh, this approach uses a route that is called paramedian. So this route, the, the, the most wonderful thing that by portal endoscopy is 
you have to apply the same principles that you apply for any spine uh, procedure. So through the Parmenian approach, you can reach the spinolaminar junction and you can get orientation during your surgery. And then you can move in that zone if, uh, as you require. But the first landmark in this Parmenian approach, the first uh, bone reference that you have to recognize during the surgery is the spinolaminar junction for Parmenian approach. And then the triangular approach is addressed uh, to this target. In this figure, you can observe the lamina and spinous process and the interlaminar space. This is a very uh, usual um, picture that the uh, surgeon that performs uh, UVE recognizes every, every procedure with a Parmian approach. Then to complete the decompression, you have to perform your work in the space and clean your bone landmarks. In this case, you, you can observe the uh, interlaminar space. Uh, after that, you can start with your uh, bone decompression, performing the undercutting or the lamino, ipsilateral laminotomy. Um, after that, you can decompress the contralateral elements and you can use as a uh, tular surgery or open surgery, your uh, flabum ligament to protect the neural elements against your instruments and as a barrier, uh, a protecting barrier for the instruments. Finally, you have to find your uh, attachment of the ligamentum flabum and you can uh, take over your ligamentum flabum piece by piece or uh, in block. Sometimes it's very easy to uh, perform the flabectomy in a block way. Sometimes it's, again, it's easy to uh, remove in piece. And then you can finally decompress the most lateral part of the subarticular area. As in this last video, you can see in this view how we, how we decompress the proximal trajectory of the neural element and the traversing neural element and the tackle sac. So you, the, the most important thing I think, I, I believe in uh, spinal endoscopy is you can confirm your landmark, your anatomy with the great visibility that, that UV can give us. Also, you have complete your contralateral decompression through paramedian approach, removing your uh, medial uh, facet or to a sublaminar, uh, you can cross the midline with your instruments and reach the contralateral side. It's very easy, but the first cases are the base where you can get more experience and perform these approaches. Uh, this is a, an example of a contralateral decompression to a paramedian approach. This is a pure contralateral decompression. You, 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 you can only see the contralateral neural elements and you don't need to remove the ipsilateral flabum or the contralateral bone references. Only you address your triangular approach to the contralateral sides and passing below the uh, spinous process and performing the, facet, the medial facetectomy or the medial undercutting of the facet because you, can, you, you, you never remove complete your facet. Uh, other other um, thing that you can uh, perform with um, UVE is the foraminal and extra foraminal decompression to a paraspinal approach. The paraspinal approach is different than paramedian. Paraspinal approach use the the route uh, that Wills will say has uh, reported previously in the last years, and you can reach the extra foraminal area and the foraminal area through this route, uh, especially pathologies or the foramen and the lateral recess, if you can go more medially. You can see here the traversing nerve and the exiting nerve and the disc, and you can perform foraminal decompression in patients with severe stenosis through this approach and decompress the exiting nerve uh, through, para, through a paraspinal approach. The ipsilateral subarticular decompression is very easy for patients for example, with uh, discernation, unilateral leg pain, uh, lateral recess stenosis, 
mild and lower back pain is not a contraindication for any approach. And internal instrumentation demanding situation should be considered with other techniques. If your learning curve uh, give for preserving all, all your bone reference and only decompress the ipsilateral nerves, you can perform very safe uh, ipsilateral subarticular decompressions. Uh, also, you have to uh, take advantage of your uh, uh, lens, the angulation of your lens. You have, you can rotate your lens, and you can observe if, even if you perform an ipsilateral approach, you can rotate your lens and observe the contralateral view of your, the of your of your facet. And you can see here, for example, uh, in a direct ip uh, ipsilateral paramedian decompression, the traversing nerve. And also, you can do, you can reach more complex pathologies. For example, contralateral and foraminal decompression through a biportal uh, uh, technique. Uh, you can see here in, in the preoperative L4, L5, uh, severe spinal stenosis. You can see osteophytes uh, in the subarticular area and a for, uh, foraminal area decreased decrease through this. Um, because of this um, pathology. And uh, central spinal stenosis in the same patient at the same, at the same level. So multifocal lumbar spinal stenosis also can be reached by a uh, uh, biportal endoscopic approach. And here is the video, for example, of this case. Uh, you can see how we cleaning or, or how we cleaning or, or surgical landmarks. Then we started with the bone decompression, we can see here how we detach the ligamentum flavum in the ipsilateral area to decompress the tecal sac. Then we cross the midline and we can use uh, key cells or common surgical instruments to go for further to deforamen in the contralateral area. And after that, you can see here, for example, how we, this is the SIP, here is the exiting nerve. Here is, here is the inferior articular process and the tecal sac. I'm performing complete decompression, central and lateral decompression, subarticular decompression and foraminal decompression. And finally, you can reach with this technique, um, other pathologies, for example, severe spinal stenosis or um, instability through uh, fusion, different different techniques for fuse with UVE, uh, but the biportal endoscopic transforaminal lumbar temporary fusion is a feasible technique for pathologies, for example, instability, spondylolisthesis, grade one or two, uh, even three. So you require experience, but the most important thing again is the visibility that you can obtain through this uh, technique. You can uh, identify the bone landmarks and then you can continue with your procedure as usually as other spine surgery. But the most important thing is your vision of your surgical landmarks. But because this uh, uh, advantage give you uh, safe for your pathology and safe for your uh, procedure. In this video, we show how we perform a biportal endoscopic fusion. Uh, we decompress the foramen. We identify the, the neural elements. We prepare, we prepare to um, uh, or identify the end plates and prepare very good on their uh, endoscopic view. And finally, we perform the fusion, delivering the graft and the bone and the cage. As a conclusion, uh, there are different approaches for treating lumbar spinal stenosis through the UV technique, depending on the on lumbar spinal stenosis type. Uh, we have central, subarticular, foraminal. So the related advantages are those associated with this. Uh, we have a lot of literature demonstrating that biportal endoscopy is a minimal invasive technique with clear visualization and high accuracy. But the modern UVE is an emerging technique, at least in Western country, for example, America. Uh, more scientific production is needed for the continued development of the technique. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Javier Bulli Oliveira. Mm -hmm. Now let's welcome the next speaker, Dr. Yaki Fischenko. He is the chairman of uh, Board of Ukrainian Association of Endoscopic Spine Surgery from Institute of uh, Traumatology and Orthopedics of Ukraine. His topic is Basic Principles of Unilateral Bypass Endoscopic Spinal Surgery. Uh, yes, hello, you thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, wait very, very, nice, very nice to see you again, Dr. Fischenko. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, my presentation will be about the basic principle of unilateral biportal endoscopic spine surgery, and it will be useful for um, uh, surgeons who just uh, starting uh, the uh, steps in uh, biportal endoscopic spine surgery. How I will describe uh, what instruments and what equipment do they need, how to prepare the surgical field and uh, make the first steps uh, in uh, this technique. Uh, so the main advantages of uni unilateral biportal um, spine surgery is the two small incisions, low damage of uh, muscles, the low damage of spine ligaments, low bleeding, low infection rate, small scar formation, excellent view, uh, short term of hospitalization, much cheaper than monoportal and much less radiation than monoportal for the patients and for the medical staff. The unilateral biportal endoscopy is the universal minimal invasive technique for treatment of degenerative disease or disease of lumbar spine. So we will describe the basic principle, properly prepare the equipment and select the necessary instruments. The main principle of uh, biportal endoscopic spine surgery is um, um, triangulation, water circulation, and uh, uh, we don't have a natural cavity, so you have to prepare good working space uh, to feel uh, comfortable uh, for all the surgery. Excuse me, the, the slide so, is, not, is not moving, the slide. What, what, what do we need? Uh, the, what the kind of Can you open the presentation mode, please? Presentation mode of your, uh, your uh, presentation. Presentation mode. You can uh, close it, then uh, you can uh, open a uh, presentation work? mode, then you can share again. Does it work now? It's uh, working, but it's uh, not presentation mode. Okay, we'll try again. Then open as presentation mode, and then you can share again. And now is not now. Not now. Mm. Close it. Before Close. the shipping, you should open as presentation mode and then you can share. Yes. Okay, we'll try. Mm. Wait a second. Um, okay, I opened it. And now presentation mode. Yeah, right. then you can share your screen now. Does it work? Yes, very nice. You can go on. So, what kind of equipment do we need? We need an X-ray operating table with Wilson uh, spine frame. We need a C-arm. We need a, a general arthroscopic system, the monitor, camera, light source, light cable, arthroscopic pump, optional shaving console and handpiece, zero-degree arthroscope, um, and uh, sometimes you need uh, the 30 degree arthroscope 
uh, radio frequency generator with five millimeter head RF electrode and uh, one and half uh, millimeter head RF electrode and aspiration system. The schematic location of personal and equipment in the mine operation room. I don't use um, uh, any assistance. Uh, um, the, I need just uh, um, uh, scrub nurse and um, anesthetic um, personnel. Uh, what um, special instruments uh, what you need for unilateral biportal endoscopic spine surgery? You can use the special set, uh, which um, uh, uh, mainly consists uh, from different special tools, which um, make it easy to make a surgery. Dilator set, curators, Harrison rogers, pituitary rogers, root retractors, Indian knife, osteotome, and mallet. The special, uh, here in this uh, picture, you can see the special UBE set, which uh, pro produced by Bones, and uh, uh, it's uh, very useful and help, help uh, young doctors uh, to make it uh, this surgery much easy. For the professional practice without um, uh, this set and uh, uh, now I use just a few pieces of this set for uh, my, uh, uh, for, it's very useful. So how looks my Mayo stand for endoscopic discectomy? I use pituitary roger set, which is an one, is a uh, big one with a three millimeters jaw. Uh, some um, uh, upper bead pituitary rogers uh, and uh, uh, two small for discotomes uh, to remove the parts of the disc materials. So, so we need a scalpel, we need a trocar, the set of telescopic dilators and the root retractors uh, and the retractor for uh, different tissues. Also is uh, very helpful for discectomy, the uh, root retractor. Wide. Also, uh, I use just two types of Harrison rongers. The more useful is the um, uh, uh, 40 degree up uh, Harrison rongers, so three millimeter. I use it um, every time, and when I stand on the right side, I use uh, the three millimeter ninety degree down uh, lumbar carousel. Um, the required surgical instruments. Uh, additionally, I use a um, uh, few curettes, the mallet, and osteotom and uh, Indian knife. So for uh, bone work uh, and for uh, to remove some tissues, I used uh, striker formula, aggressive plus uh, the tomcat and um, a few burrs. Rarely I use uh, five millimeter burrs and more useful is a four millimeter burr. So uh, I, um, for radio frequency, we need two uh, heads, uh, two type of electrodes. Five millimeter electrodes for the breedment and coagulation outside the spinal canal. And um, uh, 1.5 millimeter of curve electrodic is special for small blades on transforaminal approach or bleeding of the radicularum artery and especially useful for bleeding control of the small vessels on or near the dura. The patient position uh, on the table and uh, we use the um, Wilson frame. The, um, the lumbar spine should be on the level of the head or a little bit um, uh, upper because uh, uh, it's for their blooding uh, and for it's uh, useful for blooding pressure and for uh, less um, uh, bleeding. Because uh, uh, 
uh, and also you need to control the uh, uh, blood pressure up to 100 uh, millimeters of uh, uh So for fluid circulation, uh, it's very necessary to uh, uh, to control the um, um, uh, uh, water pressure about 30 to 50 millimeters. Because if it would be uh, less, you it will be more bleeding, and if it would be higher, it's um, uh, could um, uh, make a different uh, complications. So for fluid circulation, um, uh, it's possible to use uh, the water pump, arthroscopic water pump, or just a drip pod, uh, which for natural gravity. I prefer use a drip pod. It's, uh, you can control the uh, pressure of water by the, um, put uh, these uh, packages with uh, saline, uh, upper or down. So, uh, uh, for normal circulation of water and don't stay at the puddles, uh, you should uh, uh, make uh, normal water drains. Uh, so, the water outflow must be on the uh, special packages. Uh, so, for um, unilateral before endoscopic, we use two approaches interlaminar and uh, the dorsolateral or transforaminal. Interlaminar we use for disc herniations, the central lateral and foramen for contralateral approach stenosis. For lateral, uh, access we use for foraminal and extrafaraminal discriminations, foraminal stenosis and far out syndrome. syndrome. So, for uh, the interlaminal uh, approach, uh, uh, I use, um, uh, I orientated first of the uh, cranial um, uh, lamina and uh, my first incision uh, over the cranial lamina. Then um, I stand step two centimeters scaudal for the second incision. For the uh, transforaminal access, uh, we uh, moved two to three centimeters uh, lateral from the uh, ex external pedicular line. For the sick patient, for the small patients, it's two centimeters. For the overweight patients, we uh, step uh, three centimeters. In conclusion, the uh, UBE is the best uh, spinal care, minimal and invasive, uh, low postoperative pain, fast recovery, low complication rate. Good option for surgeons, easy education curve. And good for hospitals, the cheaper than monoportal and short hospitalization. Term. Thank you for your attention, and I stand with you, Payne. Dear, dear Fischenko, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. By the way, I'm very sad by what happened in Ukraine. My heart is with the Ukrainian people. Thank okay. you. Thanks to all the surgeons uh, work together. Thank you for all the presentations. Now, uh, if you have questions, we finished the session uh, lectures. Now, if you have any questions, please ask. I have a question for Dr. Uh, Javier Julio Oliveira. Uh, yes, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. I saw you are uh, doing the, the four for amniotic decompression. <laughs> yes, very nice. So, you know, in some station, 
to preserve the parts is uh, maybe difficult. How can do uh, how can preserve or how can be sure about the parts defect during the upper foraminal uh, full decompression? Okay. Uh, depending on your approach, because yes, it's very difficult sometimes to preserve the uh, parts when you are performing a foraminotomy, but to a extra foraminal area. So I, I think the most important thing is how you address your triangle. It's not the triangle per se, it's the, how you address your triangle, because the tip of this triangle is the trajectory of your approach. So if you perform more laterally to a modified wheel spar spinal approach, you can perform your foraminal decompression to a trans SIP approach and not posterior completely, not perpendicular that, like a common wheel C approach. If you are thinking in decompress your foramen to a paraspinal approach. If you are thinking in decompress your foramen through a contralateral approach, you can perform all your, your bone work to a sublaminar way, and then you can reach your SIP. And finally, you can, you can remove only the, the apex or the most uh, superior part and ventral part of the SIP. But if you are thinking in decompress your foramen to a wheels modified hard spinal approach, you can reach your target more laterally, like a transforaminal uniportal approach. And then you can avoid your parse if your case, if your case require. Sometimes, for example, you need to perform a decompression of your foramen to a really and true paraspinal way. And then you have to identify the inferior articular process medially, laterally, your superior articular process, observe the cleft, maybe um, preserve as much as possible the facet capsule, and then you can identify the SIP and finally perform only the uh, um, SIP removal only for the, the apex, the most superior part, and you can see your foraminal ligament and continue with your foraminal decompression. Thank you. Yes, uh, you give very um, important uh, tricks. Thank you, very much. <laughs> Thank you Professor. Uh, no, you are the uh, <laughs> I have a question for Dr. Jiver. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, we, we can deal with the uh, extra foraminal and uh, foraminal lesion by the paraspinal approach. How do you think uh, uh, so to dealing with uh, dealing with uh, uh, cannot this coordination by paraspinal approach? I, I cannot hear you, Dr. Yeah. Jiro. I'm sorry, Dr. Shang. Uh, hello. Uh, we can take advantage of the concept of new concept, new concepts regarding the transforaminal biportal endoscopic fusion. So we know right now that we can enlarge the cambium area if you perform more laterally your 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 uh, paraspinal approach. Because the, the thing is to explore the extra foraminal area. So you have, you have all, you, in, a, in a real way, you have the area because in be, between the transverse process of, the, of your superior uh, level and the transverse process of your inferior level. So you have a big area to explore since parting from the foramen to lateral. So you can, you can uh, take the control of the extra foraminal part of the disc to explore or decompress or perform a, a dissectomy, etc. So the foraminal ligament is, is more medially. So if you have an extra foraminal disherniation or far lateral disherniation, you, your most important thing to remove is not the foraminal ligament, maybe only the most lateral part after a bone removal, but is the extra foraminal disc. Is, and you can see very, very good to a paraspinal, modified paraspinal approach. Okay. 
Uh, I have an, another question for uh, Dr. Fischenko. Dr. Yakiv, I think he's left. Okay, so maybe we can ask the same question for Dr. Alfredo. Alfredo Calharius. Dr. Alfredo, here. No. Okay, maybe I can ask you for everyone. Some, especially in orthopedic surgeons, uh, uh, believe that no need special instruments for uh, UB surgery. Just arthroscopic tools with some neurosurgical tools is enough for the surgery. What do you think about that? Okay, Dr. Yazar, please. Can you open your microphone, please, Dr. Yazar? Can you open your microphone? Okay, okay. Uh, my answer is no, it's not a good idea. Uh, civilization is covered by details. And if you want to do excellent job, if you respect to your patient, this is not an experiment. Yeah. Uh, that's why, of course, the equipments must be perfect. Without any doubt in my mind. Especially uh, the ecarter, multifidus ecarter, it's extremely important for postoperative pain. If you disturb the soft tissues, it means what are you doing? Uh, so uh, we must be very kind uh, during the surgery. So we need proper equipments. Thank you very much. It's uh, very nice to hear you as a, a very experienced surgeon. Just uh, want to give a message for the beginners and young surgeons. It's not true. You should have uh, uh, fully equipment. It's very important. You need uh, special rungers, rotatory rungers, kerosens, uh, punches, everything. Okay. If you don't have any question, and I know it's very late in China, Yes, we can uh, close the meeting. Thanks for all the surgeons, their rich and generous sharing to bring us the faithful day for the knowledge. Thanks for the audience, attention and questions at this meeting. The participating experts discussed the latest knowledge of spinal endoscopy, the application UV technology in spinal degenerative diseases, and the concern of neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons through special speeches, experience sharing, and the live demonstration of surgery. I believe that the successful convening of this conference will create a broader space uh, for the development of manual invasive spine surgery in Turkey and even in the world. I hope that all the experts and the scholars participating in the conference can absorb valuable experience through exchanges, translate the results of the discussion into correct clinical practice, continuously improve our level of minimal invasive spine technology and make efforts for the cause of human health and the construction of community with the shared future for mankind. Thank you very much for everything.